Hi, I'm Scott Sipker. And I'm Amanda Mullen, and we'd like to welcome you to the summertime edition of Iowa Outdoors. On this episode of Iowa Outdoors, we practically go airborne as we pedal across the 13-story high, half-mile long, High Trestle Trail Bridge. We'll travel to Spirit Lake to help the Iowa DNR catch and produce our state's next generation of fish. Chef John Benedict will share a delicious recipe for your next catch. And we'll venture to Northeast Iowa, where the recipe for one of the nation's most popular websites is One Part Eagle's Nest, and one part live streaming video. We'll have all that and more with not a bad egg in the bun. So sit tight, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors was provided through a Reap Conservation Education Program grant. Up to $350,000 are available annually to support educational projects about Iowa's natural resources. Information is available at www.iowadnr.gov. The Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interest of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, medical care and social services, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. We're here at Backbone State Park located in Delaware County. Dedicated in 1920, it's one of Iowa's first state parks created with the goal to preserve the region's natural beauty for its future generations. <laughs> These rock cliffs were created by lime deposits from a shallow sea that covered Iowa 450 million years ago. The park gets its name from this precipitous ridge, known as the Devil's Backbone. Carved by a loop in the Maquoketa River, it is one of the highest points in northeast Iowa. The park covers just over 2,000 acres and boasts 21 miles of multi-use trails. Several paths are open to bicyclists and the park is one of the jewels in the 130 mile long Northeast Iowa State Park bike route. Hundreds of miles away in central Iowa, there's a sky-high multi-use trail that's putting a new spin on a very old path. Iowa's reputation as a bike riding destination is growing. Our fields of corn no longer solely represent the annual week-long statewide cycling trip known as Ragbri. Paved trails now crisscross much of the state, including a vast network of multi-use paths stretching for hundreds of miles. The High Trestle Trail in central Iowa runs through multiple towns and has drawn plenty of regional and national attention for one signature destination. 25 miles of concrete and asphalt line the entire Ankeny to Woodward Pass, but the trail's crown jewel rests right here, 13 stories above the Des Moines River Valley. Providing a one-of-a-kind cycling and walking vista for the state of Iowa and the entire Midwest. The first section of trail built was a thousand feet in Woodward and we just approached this project piece by piece, little by little, and slowly it all came together. And actually it came together at light speed. This incredible view is the culmination of nearly 15 million dollars in eight years of tireless planning. But the story began 100 years ago. That's when the regional railroad companies first sliced this path through the Des Moines River Valley and across Iowa's countryside. In the early 1900s, American infrastructure still relied heavily on railroad companies. Officials sought to run locomotives across the expansive Des Moines River Valley between Madrid and Woodward, Iowa. But a massive bridge was required. Years of construction resulted in a structure that would provide a backbone for rail traffic across Iowa's central spine 
for a century. Renovations in the early 1970s transitioned the piers from wood to concrete. This structure that I'm standing on was capped in 2010 and now remains the premier viewing platform for the bridge and the river valley beyond. We had to make things more complicated by bringing in art and, and making it a, a, you know, an icon. Uh, we, we really wanted to enhance this trail with art and also health and wellness aspects. And uh, the art component made it a little more complicated, but it also made it that much more marketable uh, from a fundraising standpoint. 41 separate steel frames twist their way to the center of the High Trestle Bridge. As you pass underneath, each one represents support beams found in historic mines. The artist wanted to give visitors the sense that they were descending in to a coal mine. Engineering firm RDG and artist David Dahlquist designed the artwork with the rich coal mining history in mind. After sunset, the bridge is equally as stunning. Nearly every frame was installed with LED lights, creating a blue hue across the Des Moines River Valley. but it's not the only signature artwork on display here. Iowa's geological history is well represented on the High Trestle Trail. A pair of 40-foot tall towers rest on either side of the bridge, and these dark bands represent veins of coal once mined near the region's limestone deposits. The bridge represents only one half mile segment of the overall trail. Communities like Ankeny, Slater, Madrid, and Woodward all came together to support the High Trestle Trail project. A grand opening ceremony in each community during spring 2011 brought thousands of bikers and walkers to the trail and its sky-high path. The visitors keep coming, and the latest chapter of this bridge is just beginning for one of Iowa's newest outdoor destinations. I think we really underestimated the power and inspiration of uh, beautiful scenery and how that can really um, motivate people to get out and enjoy the outdoors. And, and I guess I'm hoping that uh, folks will really start to understand the need to protect uh, the Iowa landscape, our river valleys, our remnant prairies, uh, when they are, come out to see this area. In the 1930s, the Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, constructed stone structures throughout Backbone State Park. Buildings like the Boathouse, the Stone Lodge, or this large compass were built under President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's major initiatives. I'm going down, I'm going down to DCCC. FDR's New Deal was designed to pull the nation out of the Great Depression by creating jobs for young men. Nearly all of the CCC boys' federal paycheck was sent to his parents, so many of those struggling back home could pay the bills. But the CCC was designed to help not only young men and their families, but also the nation's natural resources. With an expansive conservation plan in early 1933, Iowa was well on its way to benefiting from the sweeping CCC program. More than 46,000 boys worked on conservation and construction projects at 41 different camps in more than 43 state parks in Iowa. Backbone State Park was home to two of those camps. The CCC created trails, constructed the dam, and built shelters throughout the park. The fish hatchery at Backbone was a CCC project. Trout raised here were used to stock streams and draw anglers to the park. The hatchery closed long ago, and most trout caught in backbone are raised 10 miles away in a hatchery in Manchester. Today, there are a total of six hatcheries spread across the state. Their shared mission is to maintain a healthy population of fish in Iowa's lakes and rivers. Many of Iowa's lakes and rivers provide plenty of fishing opportunities, but many of these secret and not so secret fishing holes wouldn't be as prosperous without the DNR stocking programs. 
<laughs> For fishermen and women across Iowa, a few summertime casts at a local fishing hole can be therapeutic. Many lakes are well stocked with fish, but do you know how they got there? Or how much work has gone on for months and years prior to that perfect catch? In early spring, shortly after I out, and more than a month before the walleye opener, I ventured north to Spirit Lake. DNR officials at Big Spirit bring in volunteers and extra help for their busiest season of the year. Small teams head out on the lake at sunset, placing hundreds of feet of gill net from the shoreline out towards the center of Spirit Lake. They've got really uh, sensitive eyes for feeding, and uh, their most active time of the day is right, right at dawn and dusk. And so, uh, walleyes, uh, big female walleyes, right now are getting ready to, ready to do their spawning run up on the shoreline. Why is this the best time of year to do this? Well, walleyes spawn because of a combination of a couple things: water temperature and photo period. So as the ice goes off the lake, uh, walleyes are are waiting for that photo period and also good water temperature. So about 42 to 48 degrees for water temperature. A couple of hours later, we returned to our gill nets to see what fish had become trapped along the shoreline. And needless to say, there were plenty. For the next two hours, DNR biologist Mike Hawkins and his team pulled dozens of walleye, the occasional northern pike, and one very Last big year. muskie from the so dark we'll water. This fish broke that. loose from the gill nets and slowly floated by our boat. Holy cow! <laughs> the muskie weighed nearly 40 pounds and is a prime example of why Spirit Lake is a premier uh, spot to right capture on. fish during spawning season. This is a pretty big, this is a muskie? It's a muskie, musk uh, orange. Is this a normal size for this, is actually, this fish? This is actually probably a female. She's medium size, I'd say. This is probably... This is medium size? Yep, four, a little over 40 inches. Every fish is cataloged by biologists. There's a three and then there's probably a, a V right there, like, like an upside down V carrot. So that's a three carrot. So that means that that fish was stocked three years ago in the Spirit Lake. The best specimens are brought back to shore. The Knights Hall is transported into massive trucks, each one filled to the brim with walleye and muskie from Spirit Lake. Each team will make multiple runs back and forth to their gill nets throughout the night. Back at the Spirit Lake Fish Hatchery, the work is just ramping up. Female fish are harvested for their eggs and the process is fairly simple. A DNR specialist literally squeezes the eggs out of the fish, but it's not necessarily as easy as it looks. Yeah, just grab it right up by the head, just with your hand now, and hang on to it and, and tip it like this, okay? Okay. We'll get the eggs down in the lower part of there. <laughs> it's a dirty job. It's interesting. It's kind of weird. I feel like you don't want to hurt it. Harvested eggs are mixed with previously extracted sperm, and the slurry is placed into containers filled with lake water. Fertilized eggs will eventually hatch thousands of fish that will swim their way to additional tanks in the hatchery. These are just weeks old northern pike, and just a few short weeks later, these pike have grown to be a couple inches long. A similar fate awaits walleye and muskie caught at Spirit Lake. The harvested fish are placed back into the holding tanks, and some are equipped with digital tags. It brings the process full circle. The Spirit Lake population is monitored each season, and those healthy numbers create the next generation for lakes, ponds, and waterways across Iowa. If we didn't have um, our hatchery operations and our netting efforts like this, uh, we probably wouldn't have the walleye fishing that we have. There are 128 campsites here at Backbone State Park. And for those who don't want to rough it, there are 16 cabins equipped with kitchens, which is great if you end up with a stringer of trout while you're here at Backbone. If you're looking for a way to prepare your next catch, we're here to help. Chef John Benedict has come up with a new recipe that won't leave you floundering. Hi, I'm Chef John Benedict, and today we're going to be cooking some rainbow trout. I got some really lovely trout fillets here that I'm going to season with some lemon pepper. Um, rub them on both sides, top and bottom. This lemon pepper rub you can really find uh, easily in any grocery store. These have had all the pin bones removed and I just let the skin on the back side. I'm going to get these trout ready to go in this nice hot grill. 
one of the things to help prevent uh, this fish from sticking, because fish is a very lean protein unlike pork and beef, I got one of these uh, oil rags that I just rolled up a little towel with some uh, string and tied it. And this is gonna keep that fish from sticking. So I got that oiled up. Now I got my seasoned fillets and I'm gonna put the presentation side down first, right on that nice hot grill. You can hear it sizzling away. So when we're grilling fish, we're gonna make sure we put the presentation side down first. What I mean by that is we wanna make sure we put the nicest side down, the side we're gonna show off on the plate, so we get the really nice grill marks on the fish before we flip it over and finish it off. A little more of this garlic herb butter. We're gonna go ahead and cover this up. We're gonna cook it for about eight minutes per inch of thickness on that filet, and that filet is only about an inch thick, so about eight or nine minutes on this trout filet. We'll check it about halfway through. Our fish has been cooking on the grill for about four or five minutes, and we're gonna go ahead and flip it over using a spatula and see how it's going. It's looking really good. Flip both fillets over, about another four minutes or so, and those trout fillets will be done. Well, our fish has been cooking for about eight to nine minutes on the grill, and I went ahead and I put the vegetables on earlier before that fish, because these corn will take about 20 minutes on the grill, and these vegetables will take about 10 minutes on the grill themselves. So I'm gonna go ahead and take some of these off and stack them on our plate. I'm gonna go ahead and pull these two wonderful boneless fillets off. They smell so good and you hear them sizzling right off this grill. Stack them up. A little extra fresh squeezed lemon juice on top. And we have ourselves some wonderful lemon pepper grilled rainbow trout. In 1963, there were roughly 400 pairs of breeding bald eagles left in the lower 48 states. A defining national symbol was put on the endangered species list due to illegal hunting, loss of habitat, and food supply contamination by the insecticide DDT. After 30 years of government protection, the American bald eagle has made an improbable recovery and is no longer an endangered species but the sight of a bald eagle in the wild still creates excitement. That's one of the reasons so many people from around the world have tuned into an online feed from Decorah, Iowa, focused 24-7 on a very famous family of eagles. Thanks to a computer and some other marvels of modern technology, Bob Anderson has been able to open a window to one of nature's wonders, an eagle's nest in northeast Iowa. From a garage near the state's fish hatchery in Decorah, he shares the view with the rest of the world, seven days a week, 24 hours a day over the internet, at ustream.tv slash Decorah Eagles. Last year we had 78,000 unique computers logging on from 130 countries, and I thought that was incredible. This year, my webmaster, Amy Reese, was able to send a 24-7 feed uh, to Ustream. It's almost like watching live TV, and it's gone viral. I'm really hoping that we've gotten sites from every country on the planet. That's my hope, is every country on planet Earth is logged on. But it is, right now, it, with over 100 million total views, it's the most watched video stream on the Internet. The eagle nest that has become an Internet sensation is the same nest that was featured in the nature documentary, American Eagle. In their second year of filming, Bob Anderson and wildlife cinematographer Neil Reddick put a camera in a nest for what Bob described as an intimate view of the eagle family. The year after the filming was completed, they returned to the nest with a camera that could be hooked up to the internet. It's probably been the best wildlife education tool that I could have ever imagined. I mean, people don't understand what the the cruelty of nature and the wonder of nature, the fact that a few weeks ago we had seven inches of just slushy snow, and both the adult male and the adult female came in and were sheltering the babies, and it was powerful, powerful. So this is a really done, a, I think it's really educating a lot of people about really what's going on in the circle of nature when it comes to wildlife, you know, in all aspects of wildlife. It's a huge, huge learning tool, and that, that's really good, it really is. New to the nest this year is a camera housed in a smoky globe that can pan, tilt, and zoom, allowing Bob to focus in on whatever the action is. And an infrared camera allows people who tune into the internet site to see what is happening in the nest once the sun goes down. Both cameras have added to the body of knowledge regarding bald eagles.
we've learned that the eagles are often flying and coming and going in the middle of the night. And that was, that's an unknown. I mean, we, even though I've, we thought the, everything was learned about the bald eagles, so to learn something new and plow new ground, it's really kind of exciting. We learned that they, the males will sometimes even bring food in, in the middle of the night. And then by being able to zoom in sometimes, we've actually seen that, you know, at the egg hatching and just how it's breaking up, you know, just in, in nature in, in its rawest, purest form. And really, that's the driving force of the Raptor Resource Project to be an educational tool. And this, this is a, a science curriculum in many schoolrooms throughout the world. The view of the eagle's nest that Bob has provided over the internet has done more than record the lives of two American bald eagles as they raise their three eaglets. It has captured hearts, and according to some of the emails and phone calls Bob has received, has changed lives. I get calls sometimes from people in nursing homes that they, that they just can't wait to get out, out of bed in the morning and go to the community room so they can log on to their eagles. And I even got, a, I got an email from a woman that said, um, my husband and I quit talking for 10 years. We don't talk at all, but whenever we boot up the computer and look at the eagle cam, we talk like we're newlyweds. You know, This eagle cam touches many people in many different ways, besides being a wonderful, wonderful education, environmental education tool. Bob expects the eagles to fledge or leave the nest in late June. His goal is to capture one of the young eaglets and fit it with a satellite transmitter so he can learn more about the lives of eagles once they leave the nest. And for those who have tuned in to see the young eaglets grow, it will be the next chapter in what is the most real of all reality programs. We're actually going to try to capture one of the babies after the, it's about three weeks on wing and we're hoping to put a satellite transmitter on the baby. And the purpose of that is everybody asks me what happened to the babies from last year. And that's a question that I've heard for since we've been filming at this nest and we can't answer it. So by putting a satellite transmitter on one of the babies this year, we'll be able to follow it for years and years and years, get GPS coordinates. We might have a website saying, where is the Decora Eagle today? And just update it every day with the satellite GPS coordinates. And we'll learn, we'll find out where these babies roam until they reach adulthood and eventually establish their own nest site. That wraps up this edition of Iowa Outdoors. We're going to leave you with some more images of the Decora Eagles. But before we do, we'd like to encourage you to visit, explore, and maybe even camp out in one of Iowa's many state parks. And you can do that by reserving any campsite at any state park by going to iowadnr.gov. Scott, you're putting the marshmallow. Oh, sorry. Well, Ew. I blew the top off. Look at that. That's charred. I'm well, not eating that. The Ghostbusters couldn't even do that good of a job. You're ridiculous. I can't believe you just burned some more. I'm totally... Ew.
funding for Iowa Outdoors was provided through a Reef Conservation Education Program grant. Up to $350,000 are available annually to support educational projects about Iowa's natural resources. Information is available at www.iowadnr.gov. The Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interest of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, medical care and social services, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.